So I'm going to talk about purpose and identity tonight. <laughs> and I didn't know this when I put this together, but Pastor Bob talked about that on Sunday. So it was an incredible word, and you guys should definitely check it out as soon as you can. So God created us all with a purpose in mind. We were born when we were born, so we could be sitting right here, right now. This is where he wants us to be. But before we know our purpose, we have to know our identity. And where do we find that? In the Bible, in Christ, in the Word of God. There's a lot of things out there for us to look to to tell us who we are. Society, entertainment, our jobs. And if we've never had someone tell us or show us who we're supposed to be, we look to all the wrong things. We'll find a role model that's probably not the right role model. Unless it's Isaiah, where did he go? He's a good role model. Um, or a hero. But we really need to look to Jesus to find out who we are. He should be our role model. And until we figure that out, we're just wandering around, trying different things that don't fit. And are probably holding us back from knowing who we truly are. So who does the Bible say that I am? Let's turn to Jeremiah 1.5. That says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. So just like Jeremiah, he knew all of you before you were even born. He knew who you are, who you were, and what you were going to do. I may have been unplanned to Kevin and Michelle, but God had already planned for me, just like he planned for you. And he was waiting for me, just like he's waiting for you. And that says so in Psalm 139. Starting in verse 13, it says, You formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside, and wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it, how thoroughly you know me, Lord. Verse 15. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place. Carefully, skillfully, you shaped me from nothing to something. And then verse 16. You saw who you created me to be before I became me. Before I'd ever seen the light of day, the number of days that you planned for me were already recorded in your book. So again, he saw who he created you to be before you were even a thought in this world. You were carefully and skillfully shaped. So I think like, you got people out here that restore cars and remodel homes and and things like that, right? And when you do those kind of things, every single detail is considered. You look at it from every angle. You look over here, you look over here, up close, from far away, right? And you take pride in those creations and the intricacies it takes to, perf to perfect them, to make them what they are. And that's exactly what God does when he creates us. He considers every hurt, every storm, every great day, happy moment, and every tragedy that we would experience so he could equip us before we ever got there. I wasted a lot of years believing the lie that I was an accident, wandering around, thinking to myself, what's the point? What's the point in going to college? What's the point in having kids, a family, or really doing anything important because I was never supposed to be here in the first place. 
But I'm telling you, whoever needs to hear it right now, that it's time for you to stop believing that lie too. Stop letting that hold you back from doing great things. God doesn't do accidents. He's intentional with everything he does and creates, including you, especially you. If you've ever read in Genesis 1, the short version of what it says is basically God spoke everything into existence. Plants, animals, night and day, sun and moon, land and sea, but not us. He created us. He laid out a plan for us, and then he wove us together by hand. And then he breathed his life into us on purpose, for a purpose. God planned for us long before our mom and dad ever did. We are intentionally here right now. Sorry, I need a water break. <laughs> if you guys want to turn to 1 Peter 2.9, So that says, but you are God's chosen treasure, priests who are kings, a spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light. And now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. That's pretty black and white to me. You were chosen by him. You were his chosen treasure. And he's calling you to spread his word and do his works. So next, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 5. starting in verse 17. <laughs> this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the word to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. And we speak for Christ when we say to people, come back to God. So when we decide to make that choice to give our lives to Christ, that we're going to go all in and this is what we're going to do, we're changed. From the inside out, we're changed. We're not reformed. We're not rehabilitated. We're recreated. We are made new creations living in communion with Christ. Much like a butterfly during metamorphosis, it goes into the cocoon as a caterpillar. It's liquefied inside of the cocoon and then remade as a butterfly. It's unrecognizable to its former self. For us, the former me is dead. The other guy is no more. And I am made new. We now have the spirit of Christ inside of us. And even when we step out of that, it's only a matter of turning from our sin, repenting, stepping back into it, and letting God deal with us. And then through our salvation, we've been tasked with spreading that good news and helping people, helping point people to Christ. So why wouldn't we, right? We should be so excited about what Jesus has done in our lives that everybody around us should know. We should be so proud of our Bible that we carry it everywhere we go just to show it off to everyone. 
He's not here tonight, but it was a great example from Pastor Jake. <clears throat> but we should be telling people, you know, I gave my life to Christ, and look what he's done in my life. He can do the same thing in yours, and testimony should be flowing out of us. We are ambassadors for Christ, and we carry his authority in everything we do. So that was a little snapshot of, of who we are. So now we're going to kind of talk about why we are. If you guys want to go to Genesis 1, starting in verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on this earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is literally the first mention of man in the Bible. God is laying out his blueprint for us, for what he's going to create us to be. And from the very first mention of mankind, before he even created us, he was giving us a purpose. So let's talk about that. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. To be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, at first glance to me, sounds simply like just make babies. <clears throat> Multiply and fill the earth with babies. But what if we look at that from a today perspective? Sorry if this sounds ridiculous, but hear me out. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, right? He was purposing Adam and Eve to have babies and fill the earth. He created Adam and Eve and then commissioned them to multiply and fill the earth from there. I do believe that is still part of our purpose because it's God's will to see families grow and join in fellowship with him. So please don't get me wrong. But Adam and Eve didn't have the rest of the Bible yet. But we do. Maybe they knew of things of the future. I don't know. I'm not a theologian. But if I'm way off, See Pastor Bob, and he'll get us straightened out. <laughs> but maybe when we talk about being fruitful and multiplying, knowing what we know from our new covenant with Jesus, and looking at what was mentioned back there in 2 Corinthians 5, talking about God giving us the task of reconciling people to him through Christ, and the salvation of the cross brought us, the salvation that the cross brought us, what if that means multiplying and filling the earth, not just by making babies, but by multiplying and reconciling souls to God and multiplying believers to fill the earth with more believers? So think about that with our cell groups. The vision of the cell is to bring us together, to preach the gospel to every person, pastor believers, prepare disciples who form other disciples, and plant leaders in every nation of the world. What's that look like? Multiplication. So when God says be fruitful and multiply, being fruitful means to bear good fruit and to share it with others. If we're all sharing our good fruit with someone, we're multiplying. So keep making babies. I'm all done with babies. And for somebody else now. <laughs> but let's share our fruit and reconcile people to God as well. Then think about what that would do as far as subduing the earth goes. Subduing the earth 
subduing the world. What better way to subdue the world than to multiply souls and fill it with more believers? If there's more of us out there, then there has to be less of the world out there. They said, I might be way off, but it makes a lot of sense to me. If you guys want to flip to Genesis 2.15, I know Pastor Bob talked about this one too. Yeah, I don't think so. (laughs) The Lord placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and to watch over it. He gave Adam a job, a mission. He gave him something to do. I don't believe that tending to the garden was his sole purpose, but it was a necessary task, much like the jobs we all have. We weren't made to sit and do nothing, of course, unless it's in the deer stand (laughs) or in the ice fishing shack. Then it's okay to take naps all day. (laughs) But God wants us to be productive and do meaningful things, nurturing positive things, watching life grow, doing things that bring you closer to him. Why? because he wants a close, meaningful relationship with us. And what happens with idle time? I know for me, idle time can be a slippery slope. The longer I'm not doing anything, the less I want to do something, and the easier it is for me to do nothing. Then I'm distracted with meaningless things, and I created a void between myself and God. So don't get me wrong. It's okay to take some time after work and relax and catch your breath, but maybe playing video games or sitting on Facebook is not the best use of that time. All right, so next, if you guys want to flip to Colossians 3. Verse 23, work willingly at whatever you do as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. So since creation, God has given us work to do, but our work is not our sole purpose. Work and purpose are both important, and if we do it the way God created it, our work should be a platform for our purpose. My purpose in life is not being a mechanic, but I should be using that place and position to be working in my purpose. I do pray over the job as I come in, and and when I get into police cars and ambulances, I pray over them, and I release peace in them, and if I'm led to pray over a car, I do. But I don't know that the man that works next to me knows that I'm a believer because I've never spoke to him like that. And that's something that I've been convicted of quite a bit. And I've always just kind of ran with this idea that just being me and carrying my purpose will reach people. And although it's great to set an example, it's more important to tell people why you are the way that you are and because of who. It's one thing to carry the purpose and a whole other thing to put it to work. So it's time to start doing something with that purpose. I have friends that are contractors that model this very well. They do jobs for people at their house and they use it as an opportunity to minister to them in their homes. Sometimes it's to believers and that's great. And sometimes it's to people that won't even go to church, that don't wanna go to church. So we should definitely be using that as a platform to work in our purpose. (laughs) 
So can I get a piano? I ran through this way too fast. <laughs> <laughs> So just a few final thoughts as we close out. Ephesians 1, 11 through 12. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance. He makes everything work according to his purpose. God chose us in advance and makes everything work according to his plan. Since it's his plan, it's not an accident. God carefully and skillfully made you. He considered every detail about you before you were ever even considered. He made you purposefully and intentionally exactly the way you are. You are right here, right now, because this is when he wanted you here. Nothing by accident. He's given you purpose. He's created you to have a vision and a goal. When we lose sight of that purpose, we need to revert back to the basics and know that he made us to be united with Christ and to love people into the same union with Christ. He's given you a purpose. He has a plan for you. When we seek our identity in him, our purpose follows along with it. Otherwise, how can we know what we're supposed to do if we don't even know who we're supposed to be? Y'all wanna stand? Hold your hands out like you're going to receive something. I'm going to pray 2 Thessalonians over you. <clears throat> With this in mind, we constantly pray that our God will empower you to live worthy of all that he has invited you to experience. And we pray that by his power, all the pleasures of goodness and all works inspired by faith would fill you completely. By doing this, the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you will be glorified in him by the marvelous grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for these people sitting here and online. Father, I pray that you would touch us and give us supernatural confidence to work in the purpose that you have set for us. Thank you for your word and bless us as we head out of here tonight. In Jesus' name.